All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to be presenting this panel to you today. Um, I want to kind of start off here by discussing the title of this panel. So obviously, all of you guys found this and you're here to join us for this awesome group discussion. Um, but what does the title of this panel really mean? How to make your podcast more than the sum of its parts. So I wanted to kind of give you guys some background on how we think about this and what we're going to be talking about here today. So when we talk about how to make your podcast more than the sum of its parts, um, what we're really talking about here is the concept of podcast optionality. So a lot of times we hear this kind of film industry word um, talking about option and that really in the film industry talks about a media property or a screenplay, the purchase rights have been secured, but that is definitely not how we're using this phrase here today. So today when we're talking about podcast optionality, we're talking about literally how some of our favorite shows create options um, within what their brand is offering and within what they as creative individuals are offering. So when we use this ter term here today, we're talking about how successful shows and individuals in the audio industry diversify their streams of attention and engagement and of course revenue. Um, and I think a really, really great example of this is this quote I'm going to share with you from Aaron Mankey, who is the creator, producer, and host of the podcast Lore. And the quote is, I always tell podcasters to use as many streams as possible. Many streams make a river. So don't just sell ads on your show. Don't just sell t-shirts. Don't just do the crowdfunding. Do all of that. Find the right mix and together it will add up to something that's stronger. So I think that's a great example of what we're talking about here, how to make your podcast more than the sum of its parts, more than just a podcast, more than just crowdfunding or t-shirts or live events, how to kind of create a vibrant mix of offerings under the one brand umbrella of your podcast, or that are coming from you as the individual and creator creative. Today, we're going to be hearing from four individuals across three different brand properties that work in the audio industry, and they're going to share their own experiences with developing themselves and their brands. But I thought it might be kind of helpful to start with a couple examples of podcasters we might know of and have heard of and look at some of the ways that they are doing this as well. A great example from the PRX family is Song Exploder. So Hrishikesh Hirwe, he is the host and creator of Song Exploder. He makes several other podcasts though, you may not know. He makes one about the TV show, The West Wing, where he works with Aaron Sorkin to talk about The West Wing. He has a cooking show with my personal chef crush, uh, Salmon Nosrat, the author of Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. And then Song Exploder also films live events. I actually was lucky enough to go to one that they did with Odessa a few years ago. And um, it has recently become a TV show that some of you may have seen on Netflix. Uh, the New York Times has a really awesome profile of Frishikesh Hirwe, and it is literally titled The Inexhaustible Hustle of Frishikesh Hirwe. So I think that is a great example to start with. One other example I'm going to leave you with before our guests join us is a popular Dungeons and Dragons podcast that I have been listening to personally for about five years. It is called Critical Role. And essentially a group of very talented voice actors came together and said, hey, what if we were to create a stream of this Dungeons and Dragons game that we play every week at our house? And basically they started streaming that on Twitch, and then a bunch of fans would rip the stream, take the audio file, and create basically a bootleg podcast out of it. And then over time, the, the group realized like, oh, people are listening to this in podcast form, people want to see this on YouTube, and they really expanded. It's been really cool to see over the past five or six years how they have grown and expanded to meet demand in different ways. This group does live events, they do merchandise, they actually work with Wizards to create Dungeons & Dragons content. Um, and in many ways, I think they're a great example because they kind of defy all logic that we have about podcasts. So the data suggests that people want 20 minute podcasts once a week. This show is a four to six hour show that comes out once a week and it never stops. It's not seasonal. Um, and they have all kinds of like different small things where they, they will talk with other individuals about what they were feeling as humans creating as actors, you know, creating the show. Um, and recently they actually decided to do a Kickstarter. They asked for $750,000 to make a 22 minute short film. And what happened was they instead raised $11.4 million, breaking all kinds of Kickstarter records. 
So they said, okay, what if we make 10 episodes of this? But Amazon by that point was very hungry and had noticed and said, how about you make two seasons and we'll give you 12 episodes for each season. And that is a really awesome example of how optionality can create very, very serious fan appetite for things that you might not even be aware uh, your fans really want from you. So obviously these are huge scale, multi-million dollar examples that many of us you know, may have heard of or be aware of. But this concept is one that I really encourage even the earliest stage podcasters to start thinking about. It can really help to think about how you can leverage your strengths and diversify your streams of engagement and your own output. And so with all that being said, I'm really pleased to be joined here today by a handful of multi-hyphenate audio professionals who to, I guess, be blunt, have a lot going on. They have a lot going on for them. <laughs> so I'm really pleased to announce our guests um, who are going to talk with us about this, how this looked for them when they were just starting out, how it looks for them now, how they've been scaling, and how it works uh, in the real world. So uh, joining us, I would love to welcome Sarah Azobel and Bia Guimaraes of Trente Seche Grouse. They are GPCP alum, and we are so happy to have you guys join us. Please feel free to unmute and say hello to everyone. Hi everyone, Hi. thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, we also have Dan Sachs of the Noodle Loaf Universe joining us here today. He is a ready to learn collaborator with us. We are pleased to have you here. Hi, Dan. Hello, good to be here. Great. Um, and Katie Osuna of Copper and Heat, another GPCV alum is joining us. Hello, Katie, it's great to see you. Hello, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for joining you guys. So um, I want to just, as a quick point of order, let people know, feel free to contribute in the chat and share resources and talk to each other. We love to see that. We're going to be sharing resources in the chat for you as well. But if you have a question that you'd like our panelists to answer, we will be taking questions. So please use the Q&A function of the Zoom. I will be looking at that and I'll be asking those questions throughout and we'll try to get as many of those in as we can. So if you have questions, now is the time. Um, so thank you guys for joining us again. I would love to hear from all of you. Maybe we can kind of just go around and you can share with us the story of, you know, your podcast, but also your own individual journey in like the audio industry. And we would love to get a sense of kind of all the different, uh, pies you have fingers in, as we can say, <laughs> um, maybe, uh, Trente Seche Grouse team, would you guys like to go first? Yeah, sure. Hi again, everyone. I'm Biagi Marais. I'm a journalist with a master's degree in science communication. Hi, and I'm Sara Zobel. I'm a biology PhD that turned science journalist. We host and produce 37 Graus, a Brazilian podcast in Portuguese. 37 Graus means 37 degrees in Celsius because we live in Brazil, and it's the average temperature of the human body. Uh, our show is a narrative science podcast, and most of the time, it means this means we follow our curiosity and then we go investigate and we're trying to find uh, stories that could not be told in that same way uh, anywhere else. We just concluded our fifth season last week, I guess. Last week, yeah, I think so. So last year, our season about time, we had a story about how Sobral, a small town in northeastern Brazil was crucial for Einstein to prove his theory of relativity. This year, our season about reality had a story about a mass panic that happened in Recife, uh, the capital of Pernambuco state in 1975. And then again in 2011, uh, when people thought a dam had broken and a tsunami would destroy the city. We talked about how tornadoes happen in Brazil and even though they happen all the time, and where we live right now, they happen where we live right now. We keep saying it's it's a North American thing. It doesn't happen here. So we try to investigate these things that um, we have questions about. We released our show in 2018. Uh, and even though we are an independent, pod independent podcast with a small team, I think we've managed to do and achieve a lot of cool stuff in the last few years and, and even create a brand around around our podcast um, and we are happy to see our show on recommendation lists and the major podcast events. Sarah, do you want to talk about how we pay our bills? Yeah. <laughs> so since our second season in 2019, we have been funded in part by the Serra Pileira Institute, which is a Brazilian organization that supports science and science outreach here. Um, and also we were lucky 
in 2019 as well to receive uh, a grant from the Google Podcast Creator Program. Um, and we're, I don't know if Bia said this, but we're largely, uh, besides the Google Podcast training that we had, we are largely self-taught we kind of re did our own research and we learned to do all the steps of audio uh, by kind of studying and trying things out basically. Um, we recently won a, a Latin American Health Science uh, Health Journalism Award for our third season that was called Epidemia and Epidemia, <laughs> Epidemia in Spanish, I guess. Um, but it was published with a major Brazilian newspaper which is called Folha de São Paulo. And it was a special series about the Zika epidemic in Brazil that started here or was kind of went from Brazil from being its major um, epicenter a few years ago and then it spread around the world. And we had kind of to, we had to release this series uh, while the COVID epi uh, pandemic was just starting. So we also, it also talks about how um, the two epidemics relate. Um, we're now working on a new season, uh, which is also a special series that's going to be released with an independent um, outlet here in Brazil. It's like an independent feminist outlet, and we're very excited about it, but the subject of the series is still a secret. Um, and these kinds of uh, co-productions and partnerships, they help us pay our bills, but then they also help us grow our audience. We recently started experimenting with crowdfunding. And uh, so we have a listener subscription program now that offers a bi-weekly newsletter and also monthly meetups with our team. And we do other stuff too. So besides producing 37 Graus, our show, we, wo we work as podcast consultants. We work as mentors for various programs. We run podcast training courses. We run science communication courses. And in September 2020, we founded Cochichu, which is a Portuguese language website and newsletter that is inspired by the likes of Transom, uh, PRX, and PR Training, which is kind of a platform to help develop the audio storytelling and professional podcast environment here in Brazil. So we like to think of this website as a place where hosts, editors, producers, sound designers can learn new techniques, they, they can share ideas, they can uh, read about the trends, basically um, talk about everything involving our growing podcast industry. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us such a comprehensive overview of all the hustles. <laughs> Love it. Um, Katie, would you like to give us a little rundown of all the things you have going on? Sure. Um, so yeah, like, like Alexandra said, my name is Katie. Um, I run the podcast Copper and Heat. And it is a it is a podcast about the restaurant industry and specifically a lot of the unspoken rules and traditions that cooks and restaurant employees have been kind of upholding for generations. Um, so that's what it's about. Um, we started in 2018, and I was definitely not in the audio space before that. I actually studied anthropology um, with a focus in food, and so I ended up working in restaurants for a long time. And my partner. Uh, works in like the the digital marketing space and um, with kind of our skill sets we decided that we wanted to start a podcast because I liked journalism and anthropology and besides his marketing degree and marketing experience he um, he was a music composition major and also did sound engineering so we're like let's do a podcast um, so we started talking about some of the things that I noticed working in restaurants as a woman in a very male dominated in industry um, and specifically in like fine dining here in the US which is a whole other world. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where the idea came about and we started our, our first season in 2018. Um, and then we're incredibly fortunate to win a James Beard award um, which is, I don't know, like the Oscars of food or something like that here in the US and um, that kind of pushed us to make this more of a full-time thing. Um, so that's when I stepped out of working in restaurants for the most part, still do some freelance things here and there, but um, that's when we decided to focus on working on the podcast more full-time. And so quit my jobs and decided to you know, pursue it. And so that's when we did the Google Podcast Creator Program. Um, and yeah, we just wrapped up season three at the beginning of this year. And 
the same thing as what Sarah and Bia said, um, what pays our bills. <laughs> We've kind of created this, uh, not since we are focused specifically in restaurants and food, um, we use that expertise to kind of sell various marketing and like copywriting to, to food and wine brands. And so, um, we've done a couple like white label podcast productions. So we worked with makers, Mark, the whiskey and did a, a podcast with them. We're just, we're about to release one with MasterCard. Um, which is like an ASMR recipe podcast, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, and we also do things that are not even, even at all in audio. So we run like a social media platform for this, um, what we run all the social media platforms for this food brand that does French fries, basically French fries and other frozen foods for the food service industry. And so things like that, we're trying to just kind of like diversify, um, within the food industry. And that basically funds the work that we do with copper and heat so that we can do the, the things that we, the things that we love. <laughs> and we do do a little bit of the crowd crowdfunding. Um, we do have a Patreon and we have like merch and we do some of those kinds of things, but that's not where, <laughs> where we can actually fund, fund what we're doing. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. Love the French fry tie in there. <laughs> Getting me primed for lunch here. I am an Idaho and, girl. <laughs> yeah. um, Dan, would you like to uh, tell us what you've got going on? Sure. Um, I am Dan Sachs and I make a podcast for kids called Noodle Loaf that uh, gets released um, every other week. And each episode is between 10 and 15 minutes and consists of a few short interactive uh, game segments rooted in um, music education um, and uh, they're all them being interactive is, is a key component of, of what the podcast is so um, I'm using my background in music education which I'll get into in a second but uh, basically inform me what each of the segments is going to be so it could be um, one that focuses on singing or pitch matching um, one that's rhythm some kind of improvisational element and you know at the end of your 12 minute car ride to school you've had some kind of music education lesson but it's for the kids and i think also for the adults who are often a captive audience in a uh kids podcast when listening to a kids podcast um it comes across hopefully as just something fun and funny and silly um and uh entertaining um and the learning just kind of happens um you know in the background don't tell them uh, the show's been, I've been making it for, I think maybe three and a half years. I'm just a couple episodes away from my hundredth episode. Um, and um, it started basically because I, ha I, I'm, I'm a musician. I've been a musician my entire adult life. I was teaching in schools, um, but uh, my wife has a job who, that takes us uh, ab abroad occasionally. So we've, we've had a few international stints. And so I kept breaking up bands, restarting bands, finding new teaching gigs. And I was like, I need something portable. Uh, so I'm a musician. I uh, also have a degree in um, audio engineering and I'm a music educator. So I was like, okay, this is something I can take and sort of build. So there's a through line. So I don't have to keep quitting everything that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, and then over time it's, it started to catch on. It was started out just me kind of sending um, episodes to my friends who have kids around the same age. And I was just like, do you like this? Is this fun? Are your kids laughing? Are they singing? Um, and then I, I made it live and it started having a fan base. Uh, and I was like, cool, I think I've kind of hit on something here. Um, and I had actually, my first my and only other podcast um, was in, I think, 2003, back in the days when you had to like kind of, I don't know, put the MP3 file on your zoom or whatever um which was like a, a brooklyn local bands uh music podcast and i would go to meetups in the city with like the six other people who were doing something similar um so it's very exciting to be here uh you know well i don't know 15 years later when it's like this this you know google and prx and all this um and uh I like to think of the podcast as sort of the center of this noodle loaf universe that I'm trying to create, um, sort of the, the 
the, the center with a, with a bunch of spokes and, and it's the podcast, but it's also a reputation for being a trusted source for families, for kids, for music education, um, the same way, and not to say it's as big as Sesame Street or Daniel Tiger, but the way like Sesame Street is like a trusted literacy tool and Daniel Tiger is like a social emotional learning. I, I, my intention for Noodle Loaf um, is that it's something that families can really trust uh, because the educational element is there and the entertainment element is there and, um, and all that. So the spokes that I've kind of been trying to grow out of it um, one is a series of books, which is maybe the most successful spoke um, that that an option that uh, I've I've had. So I've had a series of um, board books for kids that have come out in the last say eighteen months, um, and they. I mean, you, I I have you know my little podcast logo and link on the back there, but those have done really well. Um, Dolly Parton's book library bought four hundred thousand copies of this one and sent it to families across the country. And they were all chosen as Amazon best books of the month or year. Um, so that's that's and these two of them started out as songs that appeared on the podcast. So that was sort of like the the gateway. And now I'm working on another series. And um, that has, you know, at the beginning, I was like, I, it was something that I wanted to do. But that that went better than I thought that it might otherwise. Um, I've released albums of music from the show that you know can be downloaded or streamed wherever. Um, I've performed live, though not as much as I was hoping. Uh, if you had asked me 18 months ago, um, for obvious reasons, uh, I've one of the first things that I did during lockdown was call a, um, a film friend and say, "Hey, can you help me make some videos to like kind of just uh, I don't know keep kids dancing through this." awfulness um and so we made some videos and then uh a production company is um approached us to basically grow that into a full tv show that we're shopping around and hopefully that will be something i can talk about the next time we all get together but um it will hopefully have a sort of uh video um part of the noodle loaf universe um and then in terms of what pays the bills, I mean, I think of the books as part of, you know, why I sit down and, and record Noodle Loaf every couple of weeks. And it's just me working on it. So it's like most of my work is just going into making the show. So anything else that I do uh, really needs to be worth the time and effort that it takes because it, um, yeah, because I want to continue just, you know, my putting my focus into into writing goofy songs. Um so I have a Patreon, which is uh, fairly active, and that's probably the biggest chunk. I do sell ads, though I'm choosy, um, and have really only started doing that more so recently. I think because it's kids, um, and because the I don't know, like the trusted music educator is such an important part of what I'm building. Um, I'm very choosy with the ads, uh, and I sell some merch. That's the smallest slice of the pie. Um, <laughs> Patreon, I guess, is probably the biggest, and um, and and some advertising, um, but uh, that's Noodle Loaf in a nutshell. That is so cool, and love Dolly Parton. Love to hear it. Um, <laughs> to have any and anything to do with her at all is. I'm done. Yeah. But that is amazing. And I think um, so. I, I'm seeing some questions, and like I oftentimes get this question uh, where. I work with early stage podcasters and they believe that at some point their show will just be good enough or maybe popular enough that they're going to just sell enough ads to pay their rent. And so I just wanted to very quickly run an exercise that will, I think, clarify some of this. So let's get a thumbs up from anyone who's ads on their podcast fun pays their bills. And then like maybe one of these, if like you get some money, but it's like, but you know, like enough to care about it. And then maybe give me one of these, if like, that is not something that you focus on as a revenue source. Mm, mm, yeah. Okay. At best we've got, we've got ah, some, um, but I think that a lot of the early stage podcasters we work with, yeah. Look at all of the thumbs downs and zeros in the chat. <laughs> 
Um, a lot of the early stage podcasters really think that this is the one tried and true way because it is the way that a lot of these standout podcasts have made money, but there is a reason that those kind of standouts are outliers. They are definitely in the minority for most people. And so Dan, I appreciated what you just said about, you know, your focus is to make your show. And so anything you spend your time and energy and probably financial resources on as well have to really be worth it for you. So I'm curious if we can talk um, just, you know, a little bit about how you went about identifying what things kind of are worth the time, how you guys think about that. Is it a monetary return you're looking for? Is it engagement? Um, how do you decide where to spend your precious time and resources when you're creating new little offerings and things to do? I'll jump in. Um, I mean, for me, it's, it's, you know, and I'm, it's probably true for most of us, like the podcast itself has got to be the most important thing because that has to be good uh, for anything else to kind of grow out of it. And I think of that also as a way, um, you know, it's such a unique and beautiful thing to be a podcaster, to like have this intimate relationship with your audience and show up in their headphones, in their cars, in their living rooms every couple of weeks. Um, and for me, it's like when I do have something else, when I have a book or a video or a new album, um, I can talk about it on the show. I can advertise my own things. And, and, um, and you know, when and the book goes out to all these families, they come back to the podcast and have like kind of an intimate relationship with them. Um, and it can, uh, yeah, it can, that's the thing that I think will cause everything else to grow. So that's definitely most important with like Patreon perks. Um, I'm so careful as to like, whether or not to offer perks that are going to like, if this is popular, is this the only thing that I'm going to be doing now? I just am whatever, um, you know, writing songs with kids names or something like that. So like, those are the ones where I'm, I, I'm, I'm really careful. But what I have found with Patreon is I think most of my listeners prefer to use it as kind of um, a tip jar almost, you know, just like a thank you, I value your show, here's some money, um, because you bring value to my, to to my, you know, our routine. We're, my kids are getting some music education and we just want to support it. Um, uh, though, I don't know, we could talk more about that later, but that's, yeah, that's my thing. Should I talk more about it now? <laughs> <laughs> um, Katie, would you want to share maybe? Or? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with what Dan said and in, in that the podcast is the most important thing and how we've kind of gone about it is, I mean, obviously we now have a couple of people that work with us in like contracting positions. So like actually paying them a decent amount of money is like one of the top things for me. And so we take really long breaks in between seasons um, so that we can focus on some of the things that make money so that we can pay people that help us make copper and heat really great. Um, so that's one of the most important things for me is, is yeah, you know, still making copper and heat great, but also um, making the money to make that happen. Um, and to the ads thing, we, we do like go after some sponsors we kind of focus on it more as like a sponsorship thing like a full season sponsorship than like ads in episodes um but I don't know how much we're actually going to do that moving forward because it's kind of also what Dan said like I I'm not a big fan of doing it I don't really want to talk about some of the things that we've talked about on our on our um podcast so yeah that's another component of it my quick answer <laughs> Should we talk about that? <laughs> um, yeah, well, briefly, we've sold a grand total of one ad in uh, Rita Sete Graus ever. Uh, and we were really choosy. Um, but we, we have a different um, problem is that here, also here in Brazil, the ad selling um, for podcasts is kind of a really starting out now. And a lot of the people who want to put ads in podcasts um, for us, it's kind of complicated because we're a science journalism podcast, so we can't just like we we don't have the ads in our own voices. Um, there's a lot of things like we won't take ads for and they want kind of that influencer kind of thing where it's like, oh, the two hosts tell you all about how they love and use blah, blah, blah. And that really doesn't mesh well with us being like a science journalism podcast. So 
Um, so yeah, we kind of uh, divested from ads and started focusing re very recently actually in our crowdfunding campaign. And hopefully that can give us um, a bigger part of the pie to pay our bills. But one thing that actually is quite useful for us as a, a source of income is uh, trainings and consulting. So we do that on the side. And we found that doing that was like an effective way because it's like constricted in time, but it pays well. So um, we can balance the podcast, which is our main and most important activity with these kinds of other things and not get overwhelmed by doing like a ton of co-productions or a ton of like white label productions, which would suck all, all of our time and not leave much for the podcast. So we've started focusing more on consulting and training and that's been working out um, for us. Yeah, for those of you who do co-productions and white label productions, I'm actually curious and I'm seeing some questions in here um, just about how that process goes. Are you actively sort of sending out a, a rate sheet to brands or are the brands for the most part kind of approaching you? And um, I saw another question that was kind of about how, if any ways you would kind of prove your credibility, you know, are they looking for material from you or is it that they hear your show and they're kind of approaching you to do that? I can pop in here related to brands. Um, so, well, and we have done a co-production as well, but um, I mean, having an award definitely helps. So I do want to be aware of like privilege there, <laughs> um, but we have mostly partnered with an agency. So like I met someone at a food event that happened to work at this agency that did work with brands and have since they, they were the ones that um, kind of brought in both the Maker's Mark project and the MasterCard project that we worked on um, so that we don't have to go out and like do all the selling and like cold call brands. I think we're going to do a little bit more of that, but um, our current kind of strategy or plan is to is to partner with people who have that connection so we don't have to do the like account management. And sometimes like the the agency that we're working with does kind of the whole marketing package. So they'll sell them like videos or also the social media production. And we just have to do the audio. And usually that also means that they pitch the concept. So we don't have a lot of say in like what the concept actually is. Um, but then also it's makes it a little easier on us. Cause they're just like, okay, this is what you're doing. This is the brief. And we have X amount of time to do it. This is when it has to go out. So it, it does kind of cut down on some of that overall planning for us. Um, so yeah, partnering with an agency has been, I think, instead of trying to cold call brands, um, partnering with somebody that that knows the work and, and definitely like having Copper and Heat, the podcast and the award, like that's how they knew who we were, the agency. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. But... Totally. I know Bia and Sarah, you have done some co-productions as well. Has it been a similar process for you or has it been more of you reaching out? Um, the last time we did it, it was in uh, last year, actually, for our series Epidemia. And it was like one or two days, maybe three days before we launched the season, we got a call from this Brazilian major newspaper called Folha de São Paulo asking us, oh, do you want to... Um, Sarah, help me with my English if necessary. Uh, do you want to like be partners and distribute and launch together the series? Because it was like the first week of the COVID restrictions mm -hmm. in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And they were like super excited to have a series about virus <laughs> and, and epi epidemics. <laughs> and it was like good for them. So of course, there, there was money involved, not enough to pay for the, the, the whole production of the series. But yeah, it was kind of like a distribu distribution and promotion yeah. partnership. Yeah, deal. Yeah, but this next one that we're doing, um, it's not with a brand, it's with another media outlet. So we actually got funding for a special series together so we're kind of we were approached by them they had this idea 
um, of doing a podcast series, but they needed someone with more audio experience because um, they didn't have that. So they came to us because they like our show. And then we kind of, um, we sent, we, we looked for funding together essentially, so. Great, that's super interesting. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions on here as well about kind of your different philosophies on using social media. Um, so I wonder if you guys could talk a little bit about how you view social media, um, even if it's disparagingly and kind of what you've had success with, um, you know, and how you leverage that. <laughs> uh, can you hear me better now? Um, I, it's funny, I, I recently deleted all the social media apps for my phone, um, so the, which will tell you a little bit about where my answer will go with this. Um, I, you know, I think you can, I, I haven't been able to notice, and I, you know, I don't know, I have like moderately successful social media accounts related to the show, and I haven't really been able to trace any correlation between like how often I post or like how good, thoughtful my posts are to um, anything else. Um, I think if other people are sharing it, uh, you know, hey, Twitter, like, check out this great kids podcast. I think that's how maybe social media will help my show. But in terms of, you know, what we were talking about a moment ago, where I put my time and energy, um, I decided that that was not an important part of it for me. Uh, basically, when I release a new episode, I reinstall like Instagram on my phone. I make a little thing that says I've got a new episode and I put it out there. So if anybody is sort of waiting for that signal that there's a new episode, they've got it. But otherwise, uh, that just did not seem like a good, um, like something that I, I want, I said something I wanted to focus on. I think some people get joy out of that. I didn't, I got what's the opposite of joy. Uh, <laughs> so, um, or I don't know, only in like sort of small amounts did I get joy from it. And my wife, uh, you know, was, she was previously at Twitter she uh she's good at it she knows how to use it and she likes it um i like to play guitar and that's anything else beyond that is a stretch um so uh that's sort of where i sit on social media i know other kids podcasters and you know there's sort of uh, i'm in sort of a, a group of um supportive of kids podcasters who support each other and will amplify hey i've got this new thing i'm trying to Get everybody to know about and everybody will you know like it and share it and retweet it and i think that's great and and that sort of thing i think has been helpful to kind of call on like fellow podcasters um uh to help amplify certain um thing you know, things that you are working on uh you know if you have a special episode or this or that but just kind of like the day-to-day -day, um like hey i need to i need to put something out there every day i have i do not feel that inside me Yeah, I have mixed feelings <laughs> about social. Um, similar to Dan, it does not bring me a lot of joy, but I do also run a social media account for like a, a bigger brand, like I was saying. So I obviously have to do a lot of research into how it works and the algorithms and blah, blah, blah. And so I understand it. And I think that makes me like doing it less <laughs> as a podcaster. Um, so I during the seasons, we'll put a lot of effort into like creating graphics and, you know, releasing things and, and all that. And had it, we even like ran some of the ads, like doing some of the, the boosting the posts and all that. And we didn't see a ton of return on that. Um, the things that kind of do the best, the, the posts that kind of do the best are when we share accomplishments is what we've noticed. So like, like sharing information from our episodes, like meh, but sharing accomplishments did great. So like, that's kind of what we've used it for. It's just like, Hey, this is what we're up to. Um, and then partnering S since we have a very specific audience, um, cooks and restaurant workers, there are so many influencers and like, I don't know, there's like the bitchy waiter line cook thoughts and like lady line cooks and like all these ones that have just like grown exponentially in the last few years that are like they're doing the thing so we just kind of like work with them on different things so we did like some instagram lives last year during the pandemic and um partnering with them and doing some things like that 
that has been much more successful than trying to like post every week and like do things on our own. Cause they have like 10,000, 20,000 people already on their accounts. Um, trying to grow my own social brand is not, <laughs> not necessarily where I'm putting, putting the effort, um, because our social following is much smaller than like our listeners. Um, so yeah, but I do still, I do want to put more effort into it. I should put that caveat in there is like over the next year, I do want to put more effort in like planning into it, um, just to have a presence, but not priority. <laughs> I think we feel the same, right, Sarah? Like sometimes we spend a lot of time um, creating like beautiful posts, like mm -hmm. science, uh, the, the same stories that people love, like on our show, the science stories we tell they love on the show, but sometimes we try to create like something special for social media. And it's, it's just okay. But when we say, oh, we won this award mm -hmm. and they just all oh, look at us like reporting on I don't know, on the street, just our faces and it's like much better. So sometimes <laughs> we just like, okay, this is important. I think we, we have we like do it. <laughs> social media. Yeah, it doesn't bring us joy <laughs> and I don't think it brings us like many listeners, but yeah, we keep trying, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it, we're in the same boat. Like our listener base is bigger, much bigger than our social media base. And like B and I don't have a lot of interest in being influencers, so um, which is another way of growing your podcast, I guess, but um, it's not in our plan. So we keep trying to make the audio good and then just have like the minimum, like decent amount of things that are possible to move or, or social media. But it's really crazy because also the algorithms change and and all of a sudden like things that we're doing well like are not doing well anymore and then you have to change and it's like you can't keep up or at least we can't keep up um so a lot of the time we're just doing what makes sense to us and what fits in our time that's such a great point about the algorithms changing um i'm so scarred from the pivot to video and then facebook <laughs> being like oh by the way we were lying about that that entire time and then our entire business models had to change like yeah i'm so scarred so i feel you on that um, so it sounds like, you know, definitely some commonalities here and with some other podcasters that I've talked to, like social media is good to show that your show is alive and that you, you know, are still making the show perhaps even in an off season. But I think a lot of people really want to see that kind of behind the scenes content or the accomplishments like you're talking about and not so much, you know, we try to teach podcasters to go away from those static images with a quote or maybe an audio clip from the show just to post that there's no real value add that that is giving to anyone who is following you. Um, I'm interested and I'm seeing some questions in the Q&A about kind of those early stages. So I want you guys to roll back to when it was all just beginning and there were so many options. And I'm curious how you decided which options to pursue. I've heard you guys say in some ways that you followed kind of your own skill set, right? Like Katie, you're saying you have a marketing degree and you have food service experience. There we go. Like that's that sounds like a podcast right there. Um, but I'm curious how you decide what things are and aren't kind of worth your time when you're in that really early stage. Do you follow the joy? Do you follow the engagement? Do you follow money? Um, just curious about your personal experience in those early days. Um, in the early days, it was definitely for the joy. I mean, I think my, the, uh, my initial push to make it was that I sort of, I liked podcasts. Then I had little kids and a lot of the podcasts that I listened to normally in the car just would not appeal to them because they're, I don't know, this American life or something. And that's just, just wasn't their vibe. Uh, so I was like, well, let me, maybe I should, I tried some kids podcasts and there's lots of good ones out there, but none were kind of hitting the mark that I wanted to have. So I decided to make the one that I wanted there to be. Um, and that was fun. And so it was really just the fun uh, and a way to also um, uh, sort of scratch the creative itch that I was having living abroad and like um, have a thing that have a thing to work on. Uh, so that it was, it was definitely, I mean, it was definitely not money early on. It was really, it was really for the fun. And then once the show was out there, it was the stats. It was refreshing and she'd be like, oh my gosh, 
45 people listen to this episode. Oh my gosh, 75 people listen. Who are these people? Uh, and that was just like kind of exciting. And then I, um, you know, would ask for listener submissions and I kind of came up with this way that kids could send in their voices singing the theme song and I stitch it into the theme song so it grows and grows each week like a choir. So now I'm hearing kids sending in their self themselves singing the theme song or jokes or whatever it is stuff from the show and that was really kind of fueling it. Um, uh, wow, there's actual kids out there in the world enjoying this thing that I'm doing um and so it was that it was it was the joy of it uh and that and that connection i mean people writing in and saying i found your show it's bringing us so much happiness in our you know hour-long commute to school every morning thank you it's like those emails uh, definitely got me through that initial stretch where it can otherwise feel like you're you know you're uploading and it's like you know it's not a live concert you're not seeing the interaction um but it does happen you know every couple weeks so there can be that like that joke you made on the last episode cracked my whole family up for a week. Like that, it was that kind of stuff that was like, uh, this is something that I want to continue working on. So it sounds like you followed the magic. <laughs> followed the magic, I always do. It, does, it doesn't always bring me to a magical place, but I can't stop it. <laughs> yeah, I think for us it was a little bit different. Um, I was kind of in between places in my life because I had been a lab scientist for over a decade and I wanted something, I wanted to change um, my career. And I got my PhD in California and I was there for the serial boom. And I listened to so many podcasts over the, the five, six years I lived in California. And I had never listened to anything like that before, like here in Brazil, like I didn't really listen to podcasts here before I went and got my PhD. And then when I came back, um, I didn't know what to do and I got uh, interested in the science journalism course and I started, uh, you know, like seeing what kind of story am I interested in telling and what can I do and what can, how can I turn this into some sort of career and I had so many hours of podcast listening under my belt and I loved the narrative podcast and here in, in Brazil, there were very few narrative podcasts at that point. It was, there was maybe you could count them in one hand, maybe. Um, and nothing science related. And since I was a science and I was in the science journalism course and there's a billion print journalists already, <laughs> um, I was like, well, maybe all my listening can do me good. And it's something I love. I love this kind of story and I don't hear it, hear it in Portuguese anywhere. So that's when I met Bia and got Bia hooked on podcast too. And then it was like, hey, do you wanna start our own show? And then the, we started. Uh, but we also want, we always wanted it to, to make it sort of professional even because I, I needed to, I mean, we had other jobs and we did freelance stuff and we had fellowships for other things, but um, I needed a new you know, way of working, I guess. So, so that's, uh, the podcast was always intended to be kind of our, our job, even, be, even because it is very work intensive to make this, the kind of stories that we tell. So we couldn't really do it part-time for very long. Um, so luckily we got funding from the, after the first few months and then we were able to launch from there. Yeah. Um, so like I kind of mentioned, I we started the podcast while I was still working in restaurants and specifically in like a fine dining restaurant where I was working like 14 hours a day. Um, that's where like the idea first came to be. And for me, it was just like, I need an outlet to get something out there because like, I'm thinking about all these things and like noticing all these like weird social interactions and in kitchens. I need to get it out somewhere. I was blogging. My partner was the one that kind of like brought his marketing <laughs> to, to the forefront and was like, you know what? I've noticed that there's not a podcast that's talking about the things that you're talking about and also not doing, there's not a lot of food, po food podcasts that are like, um, narrative driven, narrative driven with like a soundscape and like this kind of stuff that we do. And so for me, it was about just like, I want to make a thing that I want to make. And for my partner, it was like, there's a niche here that I think we can kind of capitalize on. And so it was kind of like both of those things. And as we've kind of gone along, 
for me, kind of the driving force is like, okay, what's the purpose of the podcast? And for me, the purpose has always been like, we want to make the restaurant industry better. So like, how are we going to do that? At first, the audience was like, we were going to target restaurant workers and the people that work in restaurant restaurants. Um, we realized that people, people who work in restaurants don't necessarily want to listen to a bunch of episodes about how terrible the restaurant industry is. So we are kind of shifting a little bit. I still want those people involved in creating the show, obviously, because like hearing from restaurant workers is really important, but we have to also think about like, okay, if the purpose is that, how are we going to do that most effectively? And so like everything's kind of followed along with that because, um, you know, we have to make money to pay people to make a great show. So that's still kind of like my guiding, whatever, guiding star, North star. Um, but there's lots of components to that. So that was the only thing I wanted to throw in there as well. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, I have, so we have about five minutes left and I have two more questions. So maybe we can just do kind of a quick go through about this one, but we're seeing a lot of questions about like, how do people actually find your shows then? So if social media doesn't seem to be doing it. How are people finding your shows? Do you know about that? Is there some insight you can give to how that works for your own show? Word of mouth and other people's social media, not my own, but other people's social media. Yeah, I think that's true for me too. I mean, word of mouth. I've even posted, you know, a couple of times, like I Facebook and Google have enough money, no offense, but um, uh, please, you know, word of mouth is the way this thing grows. So share this if you can. Um, and then also the shows ended up on like some curated lists. So like if you search best podcast for kids, like the New York Times and the Common Sense Media, like our 25 best podcast for kids, it's included in those lists. And I, I think that those that's probably really helped a lot. Yeah, I would say recommendation lists. We place ads sometimes on bigger shows and exchange trailers and teasers with other podcasts. Yeah, that's really helpful. And it was kind of, of a trick question yeah. just because all anyone ever says to me is word of mouth. And I knew you guys were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I had my comment for the chat all queued up. that says word of mouth because that is definitely the number one way. And I think curated lists and pod swaps and trailer swaps um, for those of you who may not know, that is basically trading a trailer with another show and you run their trailer on your feed and they run yours on theirs or an episode swap or an ad swap that run the same way or a YouTube thumbnail tile swap. There's all kinds of ways. Those are definitely very effective too. That's a good point. Uh, I've done those trailer swaps and those definitely help. Yeah, I think that kind of all still counts as word of mouth though. Even the curated list, like technically that is word of mouth because it's kind of someone you trust saying, here's the show you might like. Um, okay, great. So I think we have time for one last question and I am just curious, I saw this come up. I think this is a great question, but someone wants to know if you had kind of any advice for yourself back in those early days, uh, AKA also sneaky advice for the early stage podcasters listening, um, what would that be? What would you tell yourself to do differently or maybe to do the same? <laughs> I'd say, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah. Take the time to make a good thing. I think we had a lot of like space in the first season we had like lots of space between episodes we had lots of space between seasons we still have lots of space between seasons but I think taking the time to make a good thing quality wise is like really important so that'll be my my quick advice I think yep definitely second that make a good thing make sure you enjoy making that thing because I think, you know, so many podcasts drop off after like eight or 10 episodes and part of that, and maybe it's just not catching on, but also like it should be fun and, and enjoyable. And um, also, you know, I found, I tried to kind of like set some goals. I mean, they were very broad, but it was like, you know, I would love to see this expand and here are some ways it could expand. So to kind of envision like um, what, success might look like if I, you know, if this thing picks up. Um, so yeah, books, video, whatever it is, where the, where, what would make sense? And then kind of like, just keep that, you know, keep that dangling there. So you know what you're working towards.
Hard question. Um, I, I would say listen to a lot of podcasts, like listen, 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 like really develop like a repertoire, like know what's around you, what's in your language, what's if you speak in other languages, have other references, have references that are not podcasts and try to pay attention to what you like, what you don't like, um, how you would do it, how which pieces of things you can use in your own thing so you can start making something your own because we see a lot of people, at least here in Brazil, where podcasts is newer, um, trying to make podcasts without actually listening to podcasts very much um, and not having a, a bag of references. So you don't see anybody say like, I want to write a novel, but I don't read books or I want to be a film director. But yeah, I just started, you know, watching movies. Um, so listen to podcasts and, and not just listen passively, listen actively looking at each different element and seeing uh, how it was made, try to like reverse engineer things and things like that. I think that really helps. I think that would be my advice too. And if you're in Brazil, follow Cochicho on social media <laughs> and visit our website, cochicho.org. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Let's do plugs. Let's open up the plug bag at the end here. <laughs> um, where can people find you? And then we'll wrap up. Anyone else? Copperandheat.com and at Copperandheat on, on social. <laughs> Love a consistent username. <laughs> yeah. Also feel free to like, if anybody else has any questions, I like talking to people about this. So feel free to email me at Katie, K-A-T-Y. It's up there uh, at Copper and Heat. And uh, I've got noodleloaf.com. Um, I think all my social handles are Noodle Loaf Show. And also I see there's there's other questions. I'm happy if somebody wants to try to reach out through the website or through the, uh, I guess Instagram is the one that I tend to install more often than others. Um, but I'm happy to connect. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. This has been super helpful for so many early stage podcasters and we get so many questions along these lines. So I am really proud to have this resource to point people to. Um, thank you so much, Katie, Bia, Sarah, and Dan for joining us. Um, thank you guys so much. Thanks for everyone for tuning in from Lagos and Trinidad and Tobago and all over the place, Honduras. Um, thank you guys so much. This is the last of our webinar series for the Google Podcast Creator Program this winter, but stay tuned. Obviously, all of you guys are on the email list because you heard about this. Um, stay tuned for what we have next. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.